Looking at autism as a cultural concept and a stereotype, it intersects with different people's lives in different ways. And I am very intentionally opening this video by saying I want to talk about autism as a cultural concept and as a behavioral stereotype, not as a medically real condition. Now, it is. It is also a medically real condition. In what sense? You can take a corpse, you can take a cadaver, and run tests on the brain, and you can find brain abnormalities that equate to what we call autism. Okay, here's the problem. Number one, it isn't one brain abnormality. There's a wide range of malformations in the brain that are perceived externally and behaviorally as autism when people are alive. Now, most people just do not know the bizarre Latin geometrical terms that are used to describe these malformations. But if you think about the brain as like a bowl full of wet spaghetti, there are these complex Latin uh, ways of describing it. It's the truth. It's this Latin grammar within modern English. Okay, so the wavy lines like this, they're too scrunched together, they're too spread apart, they're too thin, they're too thick. There are these different ways in which the brain is, is poorly formed. And they're really different from one another. And you end up with like at least nine different categories of brain malformation. And they're not mutually exclusive, right? And people can exhibit what we call autism with a wide variety of, uh, of physically real problems in their brain. Now, let's take a further step. What about people who exhibit stereotypically autistic behaviors, but then they die? and we take the brain out of the corpse and we analyze it, and we say there was nothing physically wrong with the brain. There was no medically real component to this. Of course that's gonna happen. If anyone gets these fucking tests done on their cadavers, which for obvious reasons are not popular. It's a very expensive form of scientific research, and not a lot of people wanna volunteer their own corpse just to establish on the historical record how retarded, how mentally disabled they may or may not have been during their lives. It's not something they're going to take pride in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After I die, uh, I want it fucking inscribed on my headstone. <laughs> this guy was level 3 autistic. You know, type 7A autism established by uh, examining his brain <laughs> after he died. Um, nobody can really doubt that significant numbers of people develop and exhibit autistic behaviors simply because they're video game addicts, they're shut-ins, they're angry, they're truculent, they have poor record in terms of education, poor socialization, right? This is a publicly perceived set of stereotypes that get applied to people. Once they're applied to people, the people get diagnosed. Very often they get on drugs, or they get into therapy, they get into some kind of uh, treatment. And that's really the bait on the hook driving this whole industry of autism diagnosis forward. The bait on the hook is the notion that there is therapy, that there is treatment, that there is, there is something positive that can be done for you once you get the diagnosis. And for many diagnoses, there's nothing that can be fucking done for you. So in as much as parents believe it will help their child for their child to be diagnosed with autism, right? You have positive public pressure for more and more of these diagnoses. Um, as opposed to parents being told, your kid has a very tough time expressing himself or herself to other kids because you have been a bad parent. Like, oh, guess what? Like if in the future we can actually scan the brain while someone is alive with this level of um, accuracy. Oh, guess what? There's nothing, there's nothing medically wrong. There's nothing biologically wrong with your kid's brain. You as a parent have just done a fucking terrible job educating this kid, socializing. You've done such a bad job preparing this child for emotional life. <laughs> for this kid can't relate to you and can't talk to other people. Maybe it's because you as a parent were a drug addict or an alcoholic. Maybe it's because you just let your kids sit in the couch and play video games. Well, guess what? Your kid acts in a way that we publicly perceive as autistic, and even though he or she is not medically autistic. I was talking to one fan of the channel recently, and um, at first I was very much surprised that he, he told me he really has autism. And hashtag spoilers, as the conversation goes on, he, he proved to me that he really does have autism. He seems like he doesn't have any 
of the stereotypical autistic behaviors. Well, there's a reason for that. His own mother was a specialist in that field. His mother was a specialist specifically in providing positive education, rehabilitation, whatever you want to say, um, in helping autistic children. So he grew up with a mother who had just the right kind of expertise and who obviously was highly motivated to give him the best education and care and preparation for life uh, growing up. So he's a guy who, and, and I just don't need to list it off. When you go through the checklist of biologically real markers for autism, uh, including the way they respond to sound, to noise pollution, the way they respond to the feeling of a long sleeve shirt on their wrists, there are all these weird physically real things they can't cope with well. Things that um, a biologically normal person completely ignores. Um, the amount of noise at a dinner party. You have eight people sitting around a dining room table and chit-chatting with another. Stereotypically, someone with autism covers their ears and puts their head down and starts, starts freaking out, starts having a meltdown because they can't cope with this kind of background noise. And for the vast majority of, of people, people who do not have this kind of malformation of the brain, it's, it's nothing. They don't even perceive it. Oh, great. See, I was, th I was thinking, I was thinking I'd get through this video without being washed out in terms of having too much sunlight. But there you go. The sun came through a cloud. Oh, now it's way too bright. Now you can't fucking see my face. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> oh, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Real, real professional uh, YouTuber setup here. Oh, perfect. Oh, oh, this is no problem at all. Um, anyway, look, you know, we get into a really kind of fine line between helping and bullying with these things. So if you tell someone, you know, you are behaving in an autistic way, it sounds a lot like bullying. It sounds a lot like humiliating and denigrating them. But I think in this historical period right now, what we're dealing with is this. Um, if someone is acting in a way that you would perceive as autistic, in a manner that's stereotypically autistic, like you say to someone, look, you said these things to me that are so denigrating, so inappropriate, or what have you. Like, you know, you're crossing the line in this way. This makes me think you're autistic. Um, <coughs> right now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you think there's something biologically wrong with them or, or medically wrong with them. Now, I want to call in real briefly um, a parallelism from the, the world of the, the soft social sciences. Um, anthropology, sociology, certain kinds of political science. We talk a lot about behavior. Um, we use the word behavior in this very peculiar way to get away from belief. So to give you an example, any of these fields, anthropology, sociology, uh, politics, you'll find people talking about um, ghost avoiding behavior. Okay, so in many cultures, people exhibit ghost avoiding behavior. So you can ask the question, why are you doing this? There's this strange thing you do at the doorway to your house, at the gateway to the village, to ward off ghosts, to prevent ghosts coming through, to keep ghosts away from you. And the answer is, <coughs> this is ghost avoiding behavior. It's like they're managing an infestation of ghosts. Well, when you talk to these people, very often they will tell you that they don't believe in ghosts, that they've never seen a ghost. And if you ask them, well, look, do you have nightmares about ghosts? Do you actually feel afraid of ghosts? Very often, not all the time, you know, some people will straight up say to you, yes. Some people will say to you, they've seen ghosts and they're afraid of ghosts and they really believe. Okay, that's one category. But there's a much larger category of people who, who carry on with this kind of behavior without believing in it, without fearing the consequences of what will happen if they don't do it. It's a very powerful marker for belief. So not just are you doing something because you think something positive will come from that action. It's like prayer. You're not just praying because you, you want something good to happen. But are you afraid of what will happen negatively if you don't do it? If you don't pray, if you don't do the ritual, if you don't carry out a ceremony to, to keep ghosts away, are you afraid of those consequences? So the, the, the sort of judicious overuse of the word belief creeps into all those, uh, pardon me, <laughs> I said the exact opposite of what I went there. The, the judicious overuse of the word behavior creeps into those social sciences because we don't want to talk about belief. We don't want to get into whether or not these people actually believe in ghosts or whether or not they believe prayer will actually cure a disease, for example. We're saying, okay, they're engaging in this kind of behavior 
as if they believe in these magical things. And then, we, then we're going to talk about that. Now, likewise, in case the connection of politics isn't completely obvious uh, to you, a lot of people vote and they don't believe their vote makes any difference. Uh, in a lot of circumstances, here in the modern Western world, here in Canada, right, there are people who will tell you cognitively they are certain their vote in their district, like where they live specifically, cannot make any difference. And then they'll talk about how they relate to democratic institutions, uh, so on and so forth. Well, okay, you seem to still you know, participate in these voting behaviors, democratic behaviors, while in fact, um, you're really like a hardcore nihilist in relation to democracy. You think you're living in a post-democratic, a fake democratic, anti-democratic society. You behave as if you believe in democracy, and in fact you have uh, radical revolutionary attitudes that, that really the so-called democratic s system in the society you live in needs to be torn down. Okay, so you visualize that for Canada, someone who's that pissed off with parliamentary democracy in Canada. Okay, now Russia, now Belarus, right? Uh, Poland. I mean, some of those countries that are allied with the West but really don't have a legitimate democracy. How about Iran? How about Hong Kong? Hong Kong right now in 2022. This question of behavior as opposed to belief, you see how it starts to become useful and how you end up overusing the concept where you want to talk about human behavior instead of human belief, instead of human conviction because the gap between the two can be so politically important. So look, um, we're at an interesting transitional stage. What is autism? And what does it mean to take a friend of yours aside and say, look, bro, when you did this, when you said this, that was really autistic. Like, this makes me think you're autistic. This makes me question whether or not you have a medically real condition, because this is so unacceptable. Whether that's unacceptable ethically or just kind of emotionally. Like, bro, when you said this to me, like, think about what that means to me. And I know, like, right, I know, let's put an asterisk here, maybe I don't really know, but I know you didn't say it with this kind of really negative intention, like you weren't trying to break my heart or hurt my feelings, but you said this without giving any thought to the other person's feelings, without giving any thought to what the impact is going to be on me or why you said this to me in this context. And, you know, bro, this, this is really autistic. Now, again, um... I am the last person to glorify the past, whether it's the ancient past, the medieval past, or the way people grew up just 100 years ago, just 50 years ago. A lot of people in the past, even the recent past, were raised by servants. Like their parents were part of their life, but only to a limited extent. Um, I mean, in the British Empire tradition, even middle class people, not just rich people, they would have some kind of servant, some kind of nanny raising their kid. And then the kids would be put into boarding school, right? The parents would place the children in a school and they would sleep and eat and live at the school most of the time and see their parents for only so many days per year. It seems psychotic to a lot of us now. Okay, what kind of behaviors did that produce? Totally different behaviors from what we uh, think are normal today. And again, it's not just like British aristocrats. I was reading the biography of a guy. His parents were not rich. His parents were not wealthy. But his parents were employed by the British Empire. Um, and they had to move around the British Empire. So he grew up in England. And let's say his father would have a job in Hong Kong. His father would have a job in India. His father would be shuffled around this way. His father and mother were really absent for most of his childhood. And he grew up eating his meals and sleeping and playing sports at this school. This school was really his childhood home. And uh, for him, I mean, I think this must be unusual, he had tremendously happy memories of that. He was like, for him, that was the happiest time in his life, was playing rugby, playing cricket, and, and living in a, an environment that was all boys. There were no girls. And I believe he didn't have female teachers. You know, they, they tried to have all male teachers, but maybe, you know, one or two female teachers. This world that entirely um, consisted of men, and of course, uh, it's a bit like being in the army. There's rough housing, there's competition between the men, you know, not in sports only. Okay, so guys, any of you in the audience, stop and reflect on what a fucking different person you would be today if that had been your childhood, if that had been your upbringing, right? 
And of course, guess what the other difference was? I mean, I am the last person in the world to glorify playing cricket or playing rugby. It's all bullshit to me. But obviously, those people, they did not grow up playing video games. They did not grow up watching television. And, you know, they did have movies. They did have cinema. But what? Did they watch one movie a month? Probably less than that. Probably less often than once a month. Seeing a movie on, on a screen that would have been listening to radio. Very, very different pattern of behavior, right? A very different set of modes of communication, of ways of talking to people that they would then have as adults. Now, another thing I mentioned, my own grandparents, I think, were examples of this. A lot of people both grew up and grew old in former generations playing card games, playing bridge, playing poker, playing snooker, playing billiards. These kinds of games where people were gathered around, probably drinking alcohol, probably smoking cigarettes, and chit-chatting with each other. Okay, I'm not glorifying it. I'm not saying poker is a, is a wonderful game, whereas Roblox is terrible or Minecraft is terrible. I'm not. And, you know, there are a lot of things wrong with gambling. Of course, it ruins people's lives. But in terms of the behaviors we perceive as autistic, let me fucking tell you, you could not get away with this shit sitting around a table playing poker with a bunch of dudes. You need to be reassuring the other people you play poker with at all times that you're on the level. You need to be making everyone else feel at ease, feel comfortable. Yes, you're chit-chatting and joking just for each other's entertainment, right? But, <laughs> I mean, there, there are reasons why you have to develop a certain kind of relaxed, reassuring mode of communication as a gambler amongst gamblers, right? And you could say that about a lot of these other sports. Um, again, in olden times, right? As opposed to the truculent, immature, demanding behaviors that people develop and sustain playing video games. And, you know, my generation, raised by video games, as never before, right? Like, I was really the first generation. Before me, like, my older brothers, Atari 2600, it's not the same. Uh, you know, you can be addicted to Atari 2600, but it's not the same. Uh, my generation is really the first generation where the, the quality of the graphics is high enough people could really seriously lose their lives playing these games. But anyway, my generation is the first to be impacted by video games this way. We are not the first to be impacted by television this way. Definitely um, the teenagers of the 1960s, they were probably the first generation brainwashed by television. Television existed before that, but it was very limited in its effect on people's lives. But if you were a teenager in 1965, TV and movies had had a huge impact on your life. And that was one of the big differences at the time between urban people and rural people. Who got TV first? Who got color TV first? And so on. As those technologies rolled out, and as children, children started living a life where the minute they got home from school, they were watching TV. And they were watching TV from when school ended to when they ate dinner with their parents for many hours a day, every day. Right? Huge, huge cultural impact. Huge, huge behavioral impact. So, you know, I feel that is what we're struggling with on a scale of one to one, one, you know, man to man, friend to friend. I think that's what we're struggling with, uh, husband and wife. I think that a lot of people have to sit down with someone they care about and say, look, bro, this is really autistic. Like this kind of behavior, what you're doing here, it's so dehumanizing to me. It's so demeaning to me. Um, like, this falls into this flexible, medically unreal, scientifically unfalsifiable category of autism. Does that mean, I imagine, there is a pill you can take to cure it? No. Does that mean there's a therapy you could engage in that, that will solve these problems? No. No. There's no hope. All this is is an opportunity for you to reflect on moment by moment, how you are thinking about the people you're talking to. Um, okay, sorry, sometimes I pause and wonder how honest am I going to be about this. I'm going to be 110% honest here. There was one conversation I had with my ex-wife. It was my first wife, now divorced. There was one conversation I had with my ex-wife where she was just being so childish and self-centered and this was a short time before we got, we decided to split up. The legal divorce took ages, but 
short time before we separated. Um, she was just sitting there like a little kid um, ranting about the whole history of our, of our relationship. And what struck me about it was not that she was trying to hurt me. What she was saying was hurtful. It was upsetting to hear. But I'm sitting there listening to her thinking, how can this be a grown adult who just pours out her feelings, just talks in this way with no thought given to who am I talking to? What is it going to mean for him? What is it going to mean for her? What is it going to mean for them? Right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's going to sound ridiculous, but it's the truth. Communication is not self-expression. If I'm talking to you, definitionally, this is not the same as my interior monologue of, of thinking for myself. I'm seeing something for you. I'm expressing it to you. I care about what you're going to understand and misunderstand. I care about how you're going to interpret this or misinterpret this, right? Um, and to some extent, I care about your feelings. And by the way, 100% honest, sometimes you might talk to somebody and you are trying to upset them. You're, you're trying to say, look, you are being complacent. You're not highly motivated enough, whatever it is. I'm saying this in a really harsh way because I want it to have this impact on you. I want you to get upset. I want you to get motivated. I'm not saying... I'm not saying that your concern about someone else's emotions is always going to make you into a kind of pussycat. Sometimes you're going to be a lion. Sometimes you're going to be a tiger. Um, sometimes you're really going to roar at someone because you say, look, <laughs> this is what I need you to think about. This is how I need you to feel. You're really trying to have a maximum impact on them. But nevertheless, you know, it's fundamentally childish to just sit there and pour out what you think and what you feel in a self-centered way that doesn't consider the listener, right? And I think that is a mode of behavior um, that's become predominant because of the, the upbringing we all have now, the vast majority of us have, the upbringing of TV, movies, video games, um, both the presence and the absence of our parents in our lives, right? In some ways, our parents are more present in our lives, more involved in our lives than they were just 100 years ago, but in some ways, much less so. You know, you tell me, how many hours a week did your did your father work? How, how many hours a week did he actually spend talking to you? There are statistics for that that are frightening, where it's like the average American kid only talks to his own father 15 minutes a week or something. The, what To what extent this can be known and studied, but you can just reflect on your own life. You know how present or how absent we are, we are parents, and then that presence. Um, to what extent was it a, a positive or a negative impact on your on your childhood? Because it could be you had those fifteen minute conversations with your father, and you wish you hadn't. <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, <coughs> it's a very simple, very fundamental step to move from. Talking for oneself, talking to oneself, toward actually talking for others. I mean, it's something you should be figuring out how to do at eight years old, and a lot of people never do it. Why is this worth talking about? Because it's not just talk. What about living your life for others, right? With others, for others. What about really trying to help others with your actions, with your deeds, where it's not just talk? Um, one of my sisters is a so-called philosopher. Okay, She has a PhD in philosophy. She gives lectures in philosophy, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm sorry, you can read her books yourself. You can look up and watch her YouTube videos yourself. Um, go <laughs> Beth Lord. Right now you can search within YouTube. You can see lectures on philosophy by Beth Lord. You can go to Amazon, search for books by Beth Lord. Draw your own conclusions as to whether her book is more worth reading than mine, as to whether or not her YouTube videos on philosophy are more worth reading than mine. By all means, si sibling rivalry is welcome here. It's fine. What I feel about my sister um, is not so much that she was at a disadvantage uh, because she's stupider than me, which she is. She's an imbecile compared to me, and I would know. Um, but it's not really a difference in terms of intelligence, like computing power or processing speed or something. 
what really matters, the reason why she could never be a philosopher worth a goddamn thing, is that she doesn't care about people the way that I do. And I don't just care about people as individuals. I, that's kind of the easiest part of caring. You know one person, you care about them, you want to help them. You scale it up. I care about people on the level of dozens, on the level of hundreds, on the level of thousands, on the level of millions. I break down weeping, reading about and thinking about politics in Myanmar, still to this day. And I don't like Burmese people, like culturally, or per I don't have any Burmese friends. You know, I don't have that kind of connection uh, to them as individuals or to, to Myanmar as a culture. I break down weeping about uh, democracy in Myanmar. I lived in Hong Kong. I really, in a lot of ways, I hate Hong Kong. I hate the culture. I, I really, I, I don't like the, the people and so on. I, I break down weeping about politics of Hong Kong. Uh, not every day. <laughs> From time to time. You know, I'm very emotionally moved by all of these things, uh, whether you're talking about Ukraine or what have you. And also, again, I don't like Ukrainian people. It's not out of nationalism. It's not out of a personal friendship or connection or anything like that, right? The level of care I have, the level of care I take, my capacity to really care about other people, to care about the better person they could be in the future, right? You see that in all my discourse about quitting drugs, quitting alcohol, adopting a vegan diet, right? There is this better person you could be today if you'd made better choices in the past. There is this better person you could be tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now. If you start making the choices now that I made in the past, right? My engagement with individuals, with cultures, and with polities, with you know political units, whether that's a city or a country, you know, on the scale of millions, right? It all comes out of a kind of care that my sister lacks. If you don't care about people, if you're not trying to help people, then philosophy just becomes this autistic, masturbatory exercise in writing fucking mathematical theories on a chalkboard. It becomes like the worst kind of Euclidean geometry, where we're sitting around, uh, it, it's just fucking mental masturbation, let's feel superior over others, because we can, we can draw this geometric figure on a chalkboard and then sit around and, and debate it, you know what I mean? Um, and this is not a difference between academic philosophy and whatever the fuck I do as, as an outcast, as someone who could not, could not be digested within the entrails of academia. That's not the division. I think there are people within academia who really care, who really want to help their students, and who really want to challenge and change the culture they're born into, or who really want to challenge and change a foreign culture, the way I want to challenge and change Myanmar, Hong Kong, so on and so forth. Um, there, are, there are people who care, and there are people who are within academia who are real philosophers. And they, tragically, are the most unfortunate of all. We're living in a situation not only in relation to biopsychiatry, not only in relation to therapy, right? Like not only in relation to the world of therapists and psychiatrists and antidepressants and people being prescribed Adderall and so on and so forth. We live in a world where you, <laughs> you cannot be an intellectual without being a distant intellectual. You cannot be a philosopher without being an anti-establishment philosopher. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, you can't really be serious about politics without being a revolutionary. Because we live through an era in which the establishment, the accumulation of, of traditions that have come before us, in the same way that in just 50 years, we've accumulated this traditional view of depression, traditional view of psychiatry, of you know therapy, of, of taking these drugs to change your mind. Um, the accumulated wisdom and foolishness of both the last 50 years and the last 500 years. It is so genuinely oppressive and so, you know, genuinely dangerous and stupid and destructive that it's not possible to live the life of the mind without being, on the one hand, in profound opposition to it, and on the other hand, locked in an agonizing sense, locked in an agonizing position 
of trying to care for and trying to help others, whether as individuals or on the scale of millions, um, who must, who must struggle against and overcome that establishment for their own sanity, for their own survival, and in a very profound, non-ironic sense, for their own freedom.